How Collaboration Beats Competition in Competitive Spaces, The Changing Future of Work, Looking at Metrics and Tracking Holistically, and Creating Values-Driven Marketing. That and more on this episode of Advertising Influencers. Advertising Influencers. Conversations with today's top tier marketers from Silicon Valley and beyond. Powered by Instapage, the most powerful landing page solution. Hello, hello. Hope you're doing very well whenever and wherever you are listening. My name is Ander, marketing educator here at Instapage, and welcome to our flagship podcast, Advertising Influencers, where we speak with marketing thought leaders and digital advertising experts every single week. Some really, really great people we've had on the show, including VCs, VPs of marketing, and lots of other very talented professionals, such as the guy we featured last week, Josh Hanum. He's the CEO of a company called Interact Quiz Builder, and they have a platform that allows you to build quizzes for lead generation. Very, very cool episode. Recommend you listen to that when you get a chance, but first, stick around for who we're talking to today, Leslie Campisi. She's the CMO of Anthemis Group, and she is awesome. And during our conversation, we had the chance to get into the deep philosophy of so many things going on in the space right now. It's a fascinating conversation, and I especially like what she has to say about the transition that we are going through now from the industrial age to the information age. Super, super cool stuff. She is in New York City, and I was lucky enough to go to her office and interview her in person when I was there a few weeks ago. So without further ado, let's head to her office in New York and go say hello. As I said in the introduction to this episode, this is part of the, I guess you could call the New York series within Advertising Influencers, the podcast that we do here. I've come to New York. I'm meeting with a bunch of really, really awesome marketers. And one of those I am sitting with right now, Leslie Campisi, the CMO of Anthemus Group. Leslie, thank you so much for making the time to uh, invite me into your office here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And you used to work with our all-star marketing operations guy, Stefano, once upon a time. Indeed. He was actually my client. Oh, okay. When he was living here in New York. Yeah. He was working for a company in the, uh, like gaming ad tech space. Mm -hmm. I guess it's like three or four years ago, five years ago. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, He's a great guy. Well, we absolutely love him at Instapage. And uh, to anyone listening, he is the number one referrer of high quality guests. (laughs) That doesn't surprise me. No, he's quite the networker. Anyway, Leslie, pleasure to be here with you today. I think that the best way to get started, and I said a little bit about this in the intro, but it's going to sound much better coming from you, is hearing your story. The 60 second nutshell or whatever of your professional journey to where you are now. Whew, 60 seconds. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I was born on a farm in South Louisiana. (laughs) Were you actually? Uh, Well, not on the farm, but I grew up, yeah, I grew up in South Louisiana. Okay. Okay. And I never, I guess I never imagined that I would be a marketer, but Mm -hmm. I loved stories. So when I was studying, I did my undergrad at Loyola University in New Orleans and studied literature, philosophy, studies of like post-structuralism and internet theory and identity theory actually turned me on to the tech sector and i started to become really fascinated by a lot of the experimentation that was happening in tech such as well if you're like a kind of storytelling narrative geek like i am Mm -hmm. these are the early days dare i admit it of (laughs) hypertext Oh, right? okay. Right? So this idea yeah. that you could move through narratives in nonlinear ways was really exciting to me. Uh-huh. There's a great book, if you want to like go back to the archives, by George Landau called Hypertext 2.0 mm-hmm. that sort of stakes out hypertext theory. And people like Mark America had this crazy experimental fiction machine called the Grammatron. The Grammatron. (laughs) (laughs) And it all seemed to be happening in New York. And I'd always wanted to live in New York. And I thought, well, you know, I could keep studying this or I could go get a job at a startup Uh and live in the city that I want to live in. So I actually came up to New York during my spring break, senior year, interviewed at every dot com that I could find. And I ended up getting a job as a marketing coordinator before I graduated. And I moved up and that was, you know, summer of 99. So like peak dot com 
craziness. Mm -hmm. And I, I was almost hired by the sales organization of the same company. And it oh, just, it, okay. it just sort of happened that the marketing team picked me up. Uh huh. And I, I knew absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was fascinated by marketing and tech and I really just kept sticking around. And so I think I, I always love to tell this story when I'm hanging out with millennials that work with mm -hmm. me or work for me. You know, in the first six years of my career, I had six different jobs because I'd get bored really fast. I'd feel like I'd learn something and I'd, I'd want to be on to the next thing. And I think that that really helped me because I got to try out a lot of different sides of the marketing equation. Mm -hmm. So I worked in-house in a marketing department as a generalist, getting to touch everything. I also worked as a content manager at a very early social network mm -hmm. that had some community responsibilities as well. And then I also worked as an interactive producer, producing branded content, in this case, games for big children's brands mm -hmm. on Cartoon Network and, and Nickelodeon. And it was at that moment where I, I was, this is way more than 60 seconds, but I'm just going to keep going. No, it's wonderful. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I think you also get to a point early in your career where you realize you could be working on the coolest stuff. Like, I'm producing games for Cartoon Network. Like, my job is to find a sound designer who's going to help me figure out what the sound of splatting broccoli sounds like mm -hmm. on a wall. Like, mm -hmm. what could be cooler than that? But if the people you're working with are jerks, it really doesn't matter. And it was around this time that I ended up meeting a woman who really became a mentor for me at this point in my career. And she was starting a PR agency focused on serving technology companies. Okay. And I really liked her, but I thought, I don't do PR. Like, I'm not a PR lady. And she had a real vision for how the entire PR agency landscape was changing. She said, look, it doesn't matter. You have this amazing interactive social network, community building, marketing skill set. Come and join this agency and let's work together and I can teach you what you need to know about PR. Mm -hmm. So from there, I spent about, well, about, I spent 11 years running PR agencies and running some large accounts, again, focused on the technology sector. And then I had the opportunity to join Anthemis. So it is a little bit full circle because mm -hmm. I'm back in a marketing role. But it's exciting to think that someone who has a, a bit more of a history on the communications and brand side mm -hmm. is sitting where I sit. And I, I, I know we're going to talk a little bit about like marketing vision and philosophy and approach. <laughs> uh -huh. And I think that my love and my career focus on brand and storytelling and content and kind of the human side of marketing, even though I've been in some very, you know, quantitative environments too, that really informs why I do what I do and why I stay in marketing. Awesome. And what do you do? <laughs> Here at Anthemis, so you're the CMO, so obviously, you know, you're overseeing quite a few things going on, but what is Anthemis and what are you working on right now? Yeah, Anthemis is a really cool company. You know, I never imagined, even though I'm a tech person and we are, we do invest in early stage tech companies, which I'll tell you about. It's, I'm really now operating in the financial services sector. And I, I truly believe that Anthemis is the only company in financial services that I could work for. The tipping point for me was during a media tour we did last summer, I heard two of our founders describe themselves to a journalist that Anthemis was a place for high functioning weirdos. I was like, great, <laughs> I love that. I I'm love in the that. right spot. Anthemis, you know, the founders, we have three founders, they're really mission driven. And they've all worked in the financial services sector through their careers and have seen how broken it is. They know, also know that there isn't one way to fix what's broken. And so that informs the way our business is organized. So we are fairly well known as early stage fintech investors. So we've been doing that for almost a decade. We have more than 50 companies in our portfolio. Some of these companies were early stage at one time, but many of them, you know, we've grown as Anthemis with them. So companies like Betterment, Currency Cloud, Trove. Mm -hmm. So we're investors. We're also advisors. So we have a whole consultancy part of our business where we help incumbents like big banks and insurance companies figure out how to make sense with the digital transformation that's happening in financial services. And so we, we get to go into the hallowed halls of some of these large firms and help them figure out how to innovate. And oftentimes it's not about 
invest in X technology or implement this solution. It's all very people focused. Mm -hmm. What's an example? An example of one of our like consultancy clients. You said people focused. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have this whole philosophy that the transformation that's driving what's happening in financial services is kind of operating on two axes. And one of those axes is all about organizational behaviors and the future of work. There's this amazing researcher who she's actually researcher isn't even the right word to use. She's an incredible academic. Her name's Carlotta Perez. She wrote a book called Technological Revolutions in Financial Capital. And this book basically looks at four previous paradigms in how technology comes into the world, creates innovation, changes it, and how government and society and culture have to catch up to it and to create a golden age. And so Carlotta and our founders have a very specific view on where we are right now in our current shift between the industrial age and the information age. And so I feel like I'm not quite answering your question. No, this is awesome. Continue. (laughs) But we are at the point now where the focus has to be on changing the behaviors in order to get people inside organizations to adapt to new ways of working with the technology now that it's out there. That is all so, so cool. And, you know, there are benefits to working with huge companies. There are benefits to working with tiny little companies and everything in between. And it sounds like you're in a very unique position in that you have the opportunity to do just that. Yeah, it puts us in a really cool spot. You know, we talk a lot about the importance of the ecosystem and how we don't believe in zero-sum games. And what we see working with startups and also with incumbents is that we have to create a future where everyone can win. It's not about startups taking down the banks or banks crushing the startups. I think we're at a moment now, in some ways, where the financial services sector has caught up with Anthemis's philosophy that we all need to work together and collaborate to win. But you know, winning, there may be short-term wins, but we really focus on the medium and mostly on long term. Mm-hmm. I mean, we see this transformation. It's really just starting. So we're in it for the next 10 years, 20 years and mm-hmm. beyond. Really, really cool. So you mentioned uh, with these large organizations, these incumbents, as you refer to them, you mentioned that uh, a lot of it's about people, the adjustment from the industrial age to the information age. Yep. What's one of the unique challenges that you see with smaller financial technology companies and how they're breaking through the noise, how they're getting their name and their brand and their product out there? Yeah, gosh. I mean, I've in my career on the PR side, I worked with so many different startup founders who were launching companies, many of them in the financial services sector too. I would say the advice that I would give an early stage startup founder who wants to get serious about PR and telling their message would be many founders are very hesitant to talk about themselves. When you build something that you believe is awesome, a software product or technology, Mm -hmm. you want all the attention to be on that thing and not on you. But you need the PR to start in many cases before the product is actually fully baked. So I think it's really important to be unafraid to create a personal profile for yourself as Mm -hmm. a founder and a a founding team. We really like founding teams Mm -hmm. at Anthemis. And also to stake out a clear vision of what's happening in your industry and a sharp differentiated opinion about it too. Because it's that sort of vision piece that can help you find, like here come all the startup cliches, like can create some runway for you Uh, from a communications perspective Mm -hmm. until you find your first client, start to get some traction on the sales side. And then you can shift focus and and have more of your marketing and comms focused on product. So it sounds like what you're saying is that it's really important to showcase the humans behind a company. I actually completely agree. And that's one of the reasons that I love podcasting is because it takes a voice and, you know, webinars will do the same thing in a different way, but it personifies a company. And one of the things that I've seen and I've experienced as a consumer, as someone using a SaaS product or whatever, is it's so easy to forget that there are humans behind this thing that you are using. There are humans that coded it, humans that, you know, did the marketing that helped you discover it, you know? 
And it sounds like not enough companies are doing that, especially in the early stage. Yeah. And I understand why, you know, there's this idea that you want to cast a really big shadow and you do that by kind of puffing yourself up, creating a big website with lots of pages, talking about your product, but people buy things from people. And so I think that's why, especially today where credibility and trust and authority are so key for marketers. PR is never going to go away. Like the third party validation of your prospective customer thinking, hmm, I've never heard of this company. Let me Google them and see what they're about. Mm -hmm. When that New York Times article or the TechCrunch article or the, you know, search engine land article comes out, mm -hmm. like whatever your vertical is, telling the story of the people who behind the business, who created it and created the products, that's incredibly compelling and i don't believe that's ever going to go away i could not agree more now pr is obviously something you're passionate about a uh, focus of yours what do you find to be the intersection between pr and specifically advertising something that just occurred to me obviously we have a pr person at instapage uh, all the other companies i've worked at have had some sort of pr person where do you think that intersection is well, there's lots of different ways to examine that intersection. The first thing that came to mind, so immediately prior to joining Infamous, I spent some time at MSL Group, mm -hmm. which is a publicist. It's basically publicist's big global PR agency. And there was an effort internally to basically create an ad tech software product to enhance earned media to give them further shelf life. So you could think of it almost as like an in-house version of an outbrain or a tabula, mm -hmm. but because it's a part of this sort of closed system, there's some appeal there so that your PR clients for the first time wouldn't have to go to their marketing ops team or their, you know, their like digital marketers inside mm -hmm. their organization to be able to prove the value and to track that person from the earned media all the way back to point of sale or, or lead. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's, that's one way. I mean, I think that it, it's so like so much of marketing these days is about attribution and I get it, you know, but it's integrated too. Mm -hmm. We create in some ways, this like goes back to the anthemous philosophy, like about industrial age thinking about discrete units and measuring every discrete unit. Like mm -hmm. when you work for a PR firm, you know, you're almost like a factory worker, depending on the agency you work for, in the sense that you measure your time in, you know, 15 minute increments. Wow. And you actually plan out your and your team's time to the minute for an entire month in advance in order to very tightly manage scopes of work and profitability and team resourcing and all of that. There is something inside marketing that also picks up this retro industrial age paradigm where like, yes, measure all the different things, but measure the mix. And like like the, the collective value? Yeah. 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 Measure the holistic impact perform experiments, you know, mix things up, understand. But I, I just feel like there's a real danger in creating these discrete bits artificially. So I think an example of that, and I'm just saying this to make sure I understand what you're saying correctly. Let's say that I have a marketing technology company. And right now I work for a marketing technology company. Let's say that Seth Godin, mm -hmm. you know, awesome marketer, world's greatest marketer, according to, you know, a number of people, whatever. If he takes a liking to Instapage and he makes a statement about it or writes a blog about it or whatever it might be and basically endorses the product, to be clear, this has not happened. I would love it to. <laughs> but, but Seth, if uh, you're out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if he were to or somebody else at his level, I feel like the value of that endorsement goes so far beyond the traffic that came from that blog post or any sort of attribution that comes from it. You know, the qualitative value that you get from that is just so much more important. Yeah. I mean, and then it goes to defining what is attribution, right? So are you using attribution synonymously with traffic that you drive to your website or some sort of action? What about all of the attribution that's out there that hasn't materialized yet? 
that's sort of floating in the ether, like the person that did see that testimonial but hasn't done anything yet, hasn't signed up for anything. You know, from PR, the PR industry for years, and they continue to spend a lot of time and energy thinking about measurement and really sweating proving the value of PR to the organization. And so we look at things like share a voice, message pull through, like a, a lot of softer metrics that aren't quite as like, I, I don't want to use the word quantitative because they are quantitative. But again, you're, you're talking about measurement is tricky. It's not, I don't know, I'm like getting a super philosophy major right now. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's <laughs> T- awesome. Taking a thousand steps back because measurement is all in the eye of the beholder. Who are you paying to do your measurement? What does their measurement framework and paradigm look like? You know, we live in an age where we already kind of know and accept, for better or worse, that, you know, when you look at a set of data, you can make it say whatever you want, right? So how much of marketing measurement and PR measurement is just us chasing our tail, trying to save our asses and prove our our value? Mm Mm-hmm. That's a really, really interesting point. And this isn't so much of a problem anymore because of all the third party technologies out there and measurement tools, et cetera. But, you know, you have to wonder if you're paying an ad platform to run ads for you, they're the ones who are very frequently providing you with the data on how effective those ads are and how, you know, how they're performing, et cetera. But I mean, they're the ones telling you and you're, the, you're, the, you're paying them, you know, to get that information as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you see it happening in the media space too, right? Like there's now, you know, over the last 24 months or so, given what's happening politically, people are finally waking up to news origins, you know, media companies and where their news comes from and how news is created. I feel like there is some comfort probably in the kind of ad and marketing measurement community, like, it's like the old chestnut, oh, nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM. <laughs> if you know that all of your competitors are using the same ad tech measurement platforms, there's a certain level of comfort. Sure. Like you're kind of all in the same game of chicken. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think uh, it's interesting to be chatting about this because the work that I do at Anthemus these days is really focused on brand, content, thought leadership. You know, we're... A professional services company, right? Mm-hmm. So our target audiences are really defined. And even though we have lots of different target audiences like startups, like investors and Anthemis, and also advisory clients, it's a small universe and we pretty much know who they are. Mm-hmm. So I'm thankful that I don't work for a big consumer brand where I have to sweat this stuff yeah, yeah. on a day-to-day basis. I'd have to surround myself with a great marketing ops team that can mm-hmm. help me. Mm-hmm. So I really like what you were talking about with the industrial age uh, becoming the informational age. One of the questions that I like to ask in every single interview I do for this podcast is where marketing is headed. What is the future of marketing? And in that context, the industrial age to the information age, where does marketing fit into that? How is marketing going to be affected by that? Yeah. Oh, it's such an interesting parallel. And it's not something that I've thought a lot about until we're sitting here. Sure. But as I think about it, so I'm just back from, we run an annual retreat every year for the Anthemus ecosystem in France. So no complaints. Certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a series of loosely organized workshops where we take on some really big themes, things like globalization and populism climate and energy, workforce automation, you know, AI, machine learning. And we examine how all of these things may or may not impact financial services. So one of the things that is not new to this year's retreat, something we've been talking about a lot probably over the past several years, is, you know, what happens when the robots come (laughs) for the menial jobs and technologies like blockchain also eliminate a lot of the back office stuff that Mm -hmm. hasn't been automated yet but is soon to be automated Mm -hmm. that leads you directly into a conversation about like universal basic income but it also you know as a quote information age worker when you think about okay i have 
part of my, the annoying parts of my job are now done by the robots. I have universal basic income. How am I spending all my time? Mm -hmm. And what does work mean? And, and when I'm working, what am I actually doing? And so to finally answer your question, I would say <laughs> what that means for marketers is I think it could be thrilling, but that's because I love the idea, creative brand side of marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you want to take all my spreadsheets and all my dashboards away and just please do, please do it <laughs> so I can just you know, think about, come up with amazing campaign ideas, focus on networking and meeting interesting people and storytelling and creating mm -hmm. content. And so if you love that side of marketing, I would hope that as marketers um, and technologists, that that's the future that we want to create for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we have a lot of specialisms inside marketing that are all about, you know, like the people that help you understand the spreadsheets. And I don't mean to suggest that those people are going to like evaporate, you know, in the next oh, decade. Yeah. But because I think it, it is a very human job to interpret data, to turn it into insight, right, mm -hmm. to figure out what it means. But if I were thinking about, you know, I'm 18 and I'm like thinking, oh, I want to have a career in marketing. I would focus on being smart, learning how to think, learning how to write. Those are skills that are never going to go out of style mm -hmm. versus thinking you need to understand like, I don't know if this actually happens at universities, but like don't take a class on Salesforce <laughs> or, <laughs> or Marketo or, you oh, know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, I mean like, yeah. The bottom line is yes, I agree. That yeah, definitely is not something you want to do. I mean, I don't even have a degree in marketing in here. Yeah, I neither. What's your degree in? My degree is in broadcast and electronic communication arts. So a lot of digital storytelling type stuff. Yeah. And then I was in radio and then I went to internet radio and then I started marketing there and one thing led to another and here I am. So yeah, I would totally agree with that. It's really awesome to hear that validated as well. Leslie, we're just about out of time and I know you've got a very busy schedule. I've got a couple more interviews I'm doing today. It's actually nice that we're having this conversation because one of the other interviews I'm doing while I'm in New York is VP of marketing at Stash Invest. I don't know if you're familiar with them. No, but my friend who I was telling you about, Lindsay, who has the Spent podcast, mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. she's at Stash. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm so I'm try to bump into her. Yeah, I'm interviewing uh, Dale. I forget her last okay. name at the moment, but really looking forward to that. So once again, thank you so much for taking the time oh, to chat. I, we have to stop talking now, now. Yeah, yeah. I wish <laughs> we could keep on going. But yeah, this was awesome. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming on. Yes. Awesome. I want to, like, one more thing I really want to say. Please, just please. To, so yeah. I think that marketers have a real opportunity to lead the transformation of business of their businesses of the of the companies that they work for marketing should never just be about putting a happy face on a company i really believe in values driven marketing and that starts with a company that understands its values so one word of i don't know wisdom or whatever sure, that sure. i would leave people with is Make sure that the company that you work for, that you market, that you really believe is one that operates with integrity. And if it's not you as the marketer, especially in these days of sexual harassment, um, diversity issues, you know, I see it in our sector, in VC and in financial services, you need to be the one to step up and start the conversation inside your company about how the company can live its values. And if that starts with helping the company define its values, it's your job. Don't wait for someone else to bring it up. You bring it up. I am so, so happy that you said that <laughs> and that we get to end the conversation on that note. That was really great. Wow. Awesome time being here. This was an awesome conversation. Thank you once again, and I'm sure we'll talk to you soon. Cool. Thank you. Wow, that was a really, really fun conversation. I'd actually just gotten off the plane. I just arrived in New York that morning on a red eye out from San Francisco, and I was feeling a little tired, but as soon as Leslie started telling her story and the philosophical approach that she takes to marketing, PR, and advertising, I was wide awake. Major thanks to her for taking the time out of her schedule to come on the show. And as always, there's a transcript and a summary of this episode at instapage.com slash 
podcast. Lots of other resources are on our site as well, including our blog with new content almost every day, lots of videos by our all-star in-house video team, and webinars hosted by yours truly. And I'd love to have you join me for one. You're also welcome to email me if you'd like to, maybe to just talk about marketing in general or say hello. Whatever it is, I would love to hear from you. My email is ander, A-N-D-E-R, at instapage.com. And if you'd like to reach out to the rest of the team here at Instapage, feel free to do so. We are all over social media. All right, my fellow marketers, I am out for now. Cheers to your future success and cheers to better marketing. I will talk to you soon. Advertising Influencers. Conversations with today's top tier marketers from Silicon Valley and beyond. Powered by Instapage, the most powerful landing page solution. 